Today, many of us take advantage of cheap flights and public bus routes to make sure that we can travel wherever we need to go. And most of us feel safe in the knowledge that whenever we take public transport, be it bus, plane, or train, we are surrounded by crowds of people who will be witness to, or even step in, should anything untoward happen to us. However, things haven't always been this way for British public transport. It wasn't until the late 1980s that train carriages without access to corridors began to be phased out from use, as trains were such a common way of travelling through the years. Any crime that took place created mass hysteria and spread fear and doubt about how safe it really was to travel alone by public transport system. In today's video, we'll be exploring just four murder cases that fueled such terror. Elizabeth Camp. Thursday, February 11th, 1897, should have been a perfectly ordinary day for 33-year-old housekeeper Elizabeth Annie Camp. Elizabeth had gone to visit her eldest sister in Hounslow that day, staying for approximately two hours, and had done some shopping for her upcoming wedding before heading for the 7.42pm train back to Waterloo. Elizabeth's fiancé, Edward Berry, a fruitier, was waiting for her arrival at the other end of her journey. Barry was early for the 8.25pm arrival of the train, and as he waited on the platform and passages began to alight, he scanned the crowds for his fiancée. When he couldn't locate her, he wondered if they'd missed each other and if she had gone outside to wait for him. About to turn away, Barry noticed a commotion some distance away. Police shortly accompanied a small group of railway workers. Curious and likely feeling a slight sense of panic, Barry approached the group to ask what had happened, only to be told that a carriage cleaner had seen the legs of a woman protruding from beneath a seat in a second-class carriage. The woman, dead, was partially concealed under the seat. The body was taken to St. Thomas Hospital, where Edward Barry formally identified it as his bride-to-be. It didn't take doctors long to establish a cause of death. Elizabeth's body had been repeatedly bashed, and inside the carriage was a horrifying amount of blood. Superintendent Robinson of London South and Western Railway, and Chief Inspector Marshal of Scotland Yard, worked together to head the investigation. It was determined that there was no sexual assault, and so investigators quickly ruled out that the murder was sexually motivated. However, they found that Elizabeth's pockets had been rifled through and that her purse, with a small amount of money inside, was missing, suggesting that the intended purpose was robbery. Elizabeth's train ticket, which she'd had when boarding, was also missing, although it's possible it was in her purse and was not taken intentionally. However, Elizabeth still wore her brooch and earrings, so it's unknown if the killer was simply in a panic or hurry, or if there really was an ulterior motive and the scene was staged. Investigating officers recreated the circumstances of the crime and found that Elizabeth had likely fought back against her attacker. A well-built woman, fear spread when news broke out of the murder, as women wondered whether it was safe for them to travel alone by train. After all, if someone as formidable as Elizabeth Camp could be overpowered, then surely anyone else had very little chance. According to Elizabeth's sister and a porter who helped her with her parcels, the carriage that she'd entered had been empty when she did so, meaning the killer had to have gotten on at some point during the other stops on the journey. The only clues found in the compartment was an umbrella, later identified as Elizabeth's, and a pair of bone cufflinks, although some sources say only one cufflink was recovered. As investigators searched the tracks for clues, they came across a large chemist pestle on an embankment between Putney and Wandsworth, the pestle was stained with blood, and hairs were attached to it. Doctors reported that this could have been the murder weapon, given the limited capabilities of forensic science in 1897, however. No fingerprints or DNA traces could be lifted from the pestle. Police found there to be several suspects in the case of Elizabeth Camp. The landlord who owned the pub that she worked in denied any rumours that she had rejected him, 
and a former fiancé was looked into, but found to have a solid alibi. A lot of weight was placed in the fact that Elizabeth was lending money to friends and family members, and her brother-in-law was investigated and asked to account for his movement on the night that she was murdered. The most compelling piece of evidence, however, came from a pastry chef who'd been a passenger on the train. Joining at Chiswick, the chef told police that at Wandsworth, a man departed hurriedly. He was described as being a medium height and about 30 years old with a dark mustache, top hat, and a frock coat. Two porters on the train confirmed also seeing a man resembling the given description, but he was never traced. Ultimately, police couldn't connect any of their suspects with either the murder weapon or the train. An inquest ran for six weeks, and the jury returned willful murder by persons unknown. 122 years later, the murder of Elizabeth Annie Camp remains unsolved. Thomas Briggs Born October 31st, 1840, Franz Müller was a German tailor who is now famous for carrying out the first killing on a British train in 1864. Müller's victim was 69-year-old Thomas Briggs, who worked as a banker and left behind a wife and daughter upon his death. On July 9th, 1864, Briggs was beaten into unconsciousness and robbed while traveling on the 9.50 p.m. North London Railway train from Fenchurch Street to Chalk Farm. At 10.11 p.m., two bank clerks entered the carriage, only to find a pool of blood, to which they alerted the train guard. Ten minutes later, a train driver going in the opposite direction saw a body on an embankment next to the tracks, between Old Bow and Hackney Wick Station. It was found that the body was of Thomas Briggs, and he'd been thrown from the train. Missing from him were his gold eyeglasses, his gold watch, and a gold chain. However, five pounds was left in his pocket. Although Briggs was rushed to a public house where a doctor attended to him, he later died at home from his wounds the following night. He had sustained multiple head lacerations and a skull fracture. Found inside the cabin Briggs had been in was a walking cane covered in blood, leading investigators to speculate over whether this was the murder weapon or not, plus his bag. Police also found a black beaver hat that they initially thought was the victim's. However, it was later established that it belonged to the killer. On July 18th, a cab driver named Matthews came forward with his suspicions about Franz Muller. Muller had previously been engaged to Matthews' eldest daughter, and he had recently come to his house with a gold chain in a box. While he did attach the chain to his own watch, he noticed that the box was sold by a jeweler in Cheapside and authorities went to investigate the shop owned by John Death. Death confirmed that he had indeed had Franz Muller inside of his store on July 11th. Police had obtained a photo of him from Matthews, and that Muller had exchanged a gold chain for a cheap chain as well as a ring. Matthews also confirmed that the beaver hat belonged to Muller, stating that he was the one who actually bought it for him. Police issued an arrest warrant and then went to Muller's home, where his landlady again confirmed that the hat belonged to Muller. She also told authorities that he'd left on July 14th and that he did not act suspicious when he came home the night of the 9th. There was no blood on his clothes when she washed them, she claimed. Investigators found out that Muller had boarded a ship to New York and they promptly followed suit on July 20th in pursuit of him. Their ship arrived three weeks before Muller's did and when he arrived on August 25th, he was arrested. Briggs's gold watch and hat were found on him. He'd altered the latter in a flimsy attempt to disguise himself, it seemed. Muller was extradited to the UK, where he stood trial. He maintained his innocence throughout, claiming he was elsewhere during the murder, including at a brothel. Several witnesses were brought forward by the defense, and it was claimed that Muller had obtained the watch from a man at the docks. The jury did not buy this and took only 15 minutes to find him guilty of murder on October 29th. Muller was publicly hanged outside of Newgate Prison in London on November 14th. A crowd of 50,000 spectators watched on. Reportedly, before being hanged, he told a German-speaking pastor, I did it, when he was asked if he was responsible. Muller's hanging was one of the last public executions carried out in England. 
Although Briggs' murder was undoubtedly a horrible and needless one, it did provide more solutions for keeping passengers safe on their railway journeys. As a result of the death, the communication cord was implemented in all trains, and carriages with corridors were created. Yvonne Laker On the 3.25pm Southampton to Reading train on Monday, June 29, 1964, a 12-year-old boy went to the toilet, only to be witness to the grisly and scaring sight of the body of a murdered teenager. Frightened, the boy ran off screaming and alerted a passenger who pulled on the communication cord just as the train was leaving Basingstoke. The victim, 15-year-old Yvonne Laker, was on her way back to boarding school, having boarded at Southampton. Her father was an RAF serviceman stationed in Singapore, and Yvonne had been staying with her grandparents over the weekend. They ultimately were the ones to formally identify her body. Yvonne's blue holdall was found in the middle of the train, while her shoes and barrette were found the following day along the track, 10 miles south of Basingstoke. The teenager hadn't been sexually assaulted, but she'd been brutally bashed on the back of the head with a glass bottle, and had had her throat cut with its broken remains. Glass shards and copious amounts of blood littered the crime scene. Investigators suspected Yvonne had been killed just after Winchester, one of seven stops made on the journey. At this time, the train was almost empty. The only clue found in the case of Yvonne Laker was the brown paper bag with reinforced bottom, like that a wine merchant would carry. A greaseproof bread wrapper was inside, as well as four biscuits and a tin manufactured by Marks and Spencers. Despite police's attempts to identify the owner, no one ever came forward to claim the bag, and so it's suspected it belongs to the murderer. During the investigation, 40 out of 60 passengers promptly came forward and were subsequently cleared. The only suspect in Yvonne's death was a 27-year-old married father of three, who'd been arrested for motoring charges and had mentioned being on the train at the time of the murder. Green glass matching that from the crime scene was found in the pockets of the unidentified man but he claims not to know how it got there. Accounting for his movements of the day, the man said he'd gone to Basingstoke Labour Exchange and then a pub in Church Street. He then boarded the wrong train, intending to go to a Royal Marines recruitment office in Winchester, but had gotten on the Reading bound service instead. The man was brought to trial on November 23rd, 1964, where a porter said the defendant had gotten into the same compartment as Yvonne. The defendant maintained that another man committed the crime, describing him as 30, 5 foot 9, wearing a sports jacket, white shirt and tie. According to the defendant, he witnessed a man steadying Yvonne with an arm around her shoulder. I asked him what was wrong, and he said she is being sick, the defendant claimed. He then added that he didn't see the pair together after that, but he did see the man re-emerge from the toilet alone, and when the defendant asked if he could do anything, he was told by the man to mind your own business. A series of witnesses confirmed seeing a man acting suspiciously near the track before he ran off, and one even claimed that the man on trial was not the same man that he had seen. More than six hours later, a jury acquitted the defendant of the murder. However, he had allegedly torched four barns in North Hampshire and set fire to furniture at a house in Basingstoke and was later jailed for 18 months in relation to one barn and the furniture. No other suspects were ever identified, and it's unknown what really went on the day that Yvonne Laker was murdered. Her case remains unsolved. Countess Teresa Lubyanska A social activist, resistance fighter, and survivor of two Nazi concentration camps, Countess Teresa Lubyanska was no stranger to the more macabre side of life. Born in April of 1884, she was a member of a noble family in southeastern Poland, and as an adult, went on to marry a count from a once powerful clan, where she lived with him on his estate until the Bolshevik uprising of 1918, that saw the family's estate being seized, and her husband stabbed to death. Teresa fled with her son to Warsaw, where he then joined the army and died in 1939 when the Nazis invaded Poland. In defiance, Teresa joined the resistance and was later caught with escaped prisoners in her house. Consequently, she was sent to Auschwitz. 
and then moved to Ravensbrück concentration camp. When she was later released, Teresa fled to the UK, where she worked on behalf of wartime prisoners, seeking compensation for them. At the time of her death in 1957, she was 73 years old and lived in a flat in Kensington. Prior to the attack that led to her death on May 24, 1957, Teresa told friends that she'd been to the police to tell them that she felt threatened and that her life could be at risk. But further details of why she felt threatened or who was threatening her remain unknown. The night of her murder, Teresa was on her way home from having dinner with friends in Ealing. A member of staff on duty at the Gloucester Road underground station heard footsteps on the emergency stairs at around 10.20 p.m. This wasn't an uncommon sound, as people who wanted to avoid paying for tickets would often try and sneak by using the stairs. However, shortly after the sound of footsteps, a woman's voice shouted, Bandit. Somewhat alarmed, the member of staff went to investigate and found a woman who was tall and white-haired, walking slowly to the lift. Noting her frailty, the staff member offered her his arm and helped her to the lift. Asking, what about bandits? Teresa then replied, I have been knifed. It was then that the staff member noticed blood running down the front of her jacket. He asked where the bandit was, but Teresa told him that she didn't know. At street level, emergency services were called and Teresa was put in the temporary care of the station inspector. A passing detective constable accompanied the woman to St. Mary's Hospital and en route, she told him, I was on the platform, then stabbed. Teresa died shortly after arriving at the hospital. The team of investigating officers searched the train station but were unable to come up with any murder weapons. They also found there to be no blood anywhere but near the lift, meaning that they couldn't locate just where exactly the murder took place. As authorities searched for a motive behind the killing, they ruled out a robbery, since nothing was stolen from Teresa. They also thought that a well-lit platform in a public place wasn't a likely place to carry out premeditated murder, and that a small knife, like the one that created Teresa's five stab wounds, was unlikely to be used for an assassination. Although the train Teresa rode was identified, neither the guard nor the driver saw anything or anyone suspicious. The adjacent tunnels were searched, but no new leads came of this. It's theorized that the murderer escaped via the emergency stairs. Investigators worked tirelessly on Teresa's case. London Transport Police traced bus drivers and conductors in the area at the time. A total of 214 Piccadilly Line trains were examined. Hundreds of railway staff were interviewed, including 64 train crews. Every knife found over the next few months was given to the police so it could be forensically looked over. At an inquest held on the 19th of August 1957, it was found that a huge 18,000 people had been interviewed by the police during the course of the investigation. The verdict of the inquest was, unsurprisingly, murder by person slash persons unknown. Polish-speaking police officers intermingled with guests at Teresa's funeral in Brompton Oratory listing out for any clues or culprits to reveal themselves, but nothing came of this attempt at finding answers. Several suspects were identified in Teresa's murder, including a school worker who had turned up the next morning with a black eye and scratches on his face, but this lead did not appear to pan out. A man seen loitering in the station days prior to the attack was traced and located, but it turns out he was in psychiatric care at the time of the crime. Despite the extensive and thorough investigation by authorities, the murder of Teresa Lubyanska remains unsolved. So that's four chilling train murders. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.